Hello, welcome to or welcome back to the Committee on Security of America's Medical Supply Chain. Uh, we are uh, in a, a open session of our committee meeting and uh, the um, we're about to move into a session on current critical uh, slash essential medical product lists. And so our, we have a uh, set of um, eminent uh, speakers for this panel. Uh, and I'm going to um, invite each of them to speak for five minutes, and then we'll open it up to a question and answer session in which the committee will ask questions. So our focus is really on the current lists of critical medical products, how they're developed, how they're currently being used, what lessons we can take away from that, and the, the purpose that we're looking toward uh, using that information in our study is to help us prioritize the scope uh, and focus of our study. How do we identify what's essential in the medical supply chain to focus on? So um, we are going to try to draw on your experiences. And to kick us off, it is my pleasure to introduce Linda Ricci from the FDA. Linda, can you take it? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, actually, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Doug Throckmorton, to walk through the FDA slides. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Dr. Hopp. Appreciate the opportunity for the FDA to participate in this. Um, as you said, I'm, I'm going to focus specifically on the essential medicines work that the agency has recently undertaken. Linda and I shared the responsibilities for developing the lists with the with the, a participant from the Center for Biologics because the products, as you'll see, um, exist in all three of the product centers, the medical product centers. Um, in the agency and we needed to work together. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. And uh, I'm gonna talk very briefly about the origins of the list, which are in the executive order that was, was put out last fall, uh, last summer, I'm sorry. I do that because I think those origins are important to understand because they helped guide us in our work. Um, and, and I heard some of the comments this morning of, um, wondering about the scope of the list, and, and it's important to understand that it was driven by the executive order. Um, then I'm going to talk very briefly about the, the process that was used to derive the executive list, the executive order list, list of essential medicines, of medical countermeasures, and the critical inputs that are required to manufacture those, those products. Then I'm going to leap ahead. I, I in, in the slide deck that was presented, um, there's a long there are several slides that go through the criteria that were used to inform the development of the list. I'm not going to go through those slides in any detail. You can look at them when you have an opportunity. They lay out the criteria we applied to the available medical products to determine which ones belonged on the list and which ones, ones should be left off the list for present. Um, then I'm going to talk very briefly about next steps, which, uh, you know, continued work is ongoing as a result of the list's uh, publication to finalize and implement it. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. <clears throat> as I said, the essential medicines list created by the Food and Drug Administration was grounded in the executive order put out August of last year on ensuring in in essential medicines, medical countermeasures and critical inputs are made in the United States. And under that order, the FDA was directed to identify a list and this is important, um, medically necessary to have available at all times in amounts adequate to serve patient needs and in the appropriate dosage forms. Uh, we use those words to help derive first the criteria that would be needed to identify the products and then to identify the products themselves and the, active, the, the, the materials that are necessary to create them. Next slide, please. Um, I won't read this in great detail. These are the words that the executive order includes regarding the essential medicines list. Importantly, 90 days was the amount of time that we were given to create the list, which obviously made it challenging for us to have extensive conversations with outside groups. Public comment was challenging for us to do, although we understand the importance of that. We were directed to, to include discussions with several other parts, several other agencies within the US government, 
and you can see them listed here. Obviously, we take those responsibilities very seriously. Next slide, please. So next slide, please. Creation of the list included first individuals from across the agency to assure consistency in the interpretation and the, and the, and the deliverables. Um, it included subject matter experts and it included where possible discussions with other federal agencies and partners. Um, we published a list at the end of October, October 30th, 2020. And you can, you can go to see the full list there at that link. Um, we also created a docket to solicit public comment around specific questions that we have regarding the list and how we might make best use of it. Next slide, please. This is the list. I won't go into in great detail, um, just to show you that we've tried to, we, we tried to make it as accessible as possible, recognizing that because it is a relatively long list, it is a challenge to present uh, um, in an easy format online. Next slide, please. This slide through slide 15 talk about the criteria that were used to create the three kinds of products, the essential medicines, the medical countermeasures, and the, and, and the critical inputs. It's important to understand that the essential medicines and the medical countermeasures and the devices that Linda um, is happy to answer questions about all used slightly different criteria. We believe that that was consistent with how the executive order was phrased. We believe that was consistent with how the executive order directed us to act. Um, importantly, the focus was on products that are necessary to address immediately life-threatening medical conditions that are encountered in US acute care medical settings. Um, I'd refer you to the slides without going into great detail, except that we understood the interest in longer term chronic care management medicines and the importance of having them available. But we felt that the place to begin was with a focus on life-threatening acute care, life-threatening medical conditions. Um, given where we are in the COVID response, given our understanding of the, of the intent of the executive order. If you could go to slide 15 now, and again, I'm happy to answer questions about any of the slides in the middle in the discussion, but I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, 15, please. Yeah, there you go. This is the executive order list by the numbers. 227 medicines on the drug and biologics executive order list of which 174 were considered essential medicines. That is, they used those criteria to be identified. 53 were identified through the application of the medical countermeasures criteria. 96 medical device pro codes were identified using, using those same sets of criteria and identified by the Center for Devices. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next steps following the creation of that list and its publication in late October, as well as the creation of the, the, the docket that I mentioned before is first continued consultation with the agencies that are named in the executive order. Those, that work is continuing. It's important for us to continue to refine the list where appropriate. We need to consider the public comments as they come in. A process needs to be set up to identify how those things, th th those comments might um, a, a affect the list going forward, um, including the need to periodically update the list. Next slide, please. There are other provisions of the executive order that I'm not going to mention today, but I just want to make sure that you know there are those, there is other work to be done that the agency is undertaking right now, not directly related to the essential medicines list that, I, that I'm not going to go into in any greater detail, but happy to answer any questions if they come up. Next slide. I believe I'm. I believe I'm coming to the end of my slide deck. Um, with that, I'm. I'm going to turn it over, Dr. Hop. Happy to answer any questions that we can. Okay. Thank you, Doug. That was excellent. So, so um, we're going to go through the rest of the speakers here, and then we'll come back. And I'm sure we, our uh, committee members will have plenty of questions for you. So um, next on our list uh, is Steve Schondelmeyer, who's back for a second dose here this afternoon. Steve, are you there? Greetings. I am here and uh, glad to be back with you. Um, I'm going to present uh, several current uh, 
critical drug list that we've created at the Resilient Drug Supply Project. And if you go to the next slide, Ben. Uh, first, our Resilient Drug Supply Project, I must tell you kind of how this started. There's a, a person who had a critical illness. Uh, she went to an emergency room for uh, treatment, a life-threatening illness. And this person was told that the drug you need simply is not available in the hospital. And this person happened to be you know, rather well-to-do, had good means, and she pulled aside the physicians taking care of her and said, I don't care what it costs, find the drug and I'll pay for it. And they came back a few hours later and said, the drug simply is not available. We can't get the drug, the supply is not there. Now, fortunately, this person lived through the life-threatening situation and they were able through good medical care to, to get her through it, but this scared uh, the person. That person um, with their personal wealth, personal family foundation made a donation, uh, called up my colleague, Dr. Michael Osterholm, uh, who is heavily involved in uh, uh, pandemics and COVID and, and predicting what's happening. And she said, uh, Dr. Osterholm, can't you do something to solve the drug shortage problem so that people like me don't have to lay in a hospital wondering, am I gonna live or die because this drug is not available? And so she said, I'll fund a project. You design, put together a team, design a project to understand drug shortages and see what we can do about them. So back in December of 2018, this is a full, uh, year or more before COVID-19 was on our radar screen, we began addressing drug shortages. We pulled together a panel of experts from government, academia, and the private sector. We had uh, professionals from the disciplines of pharmacy, medicine, nursing, public health. We had stakeholders from a variety of federal agencies, drug manufacturers, wholesalers, other supply chain and distribution uh, parties, health system and hospitals emergency medical services, emergency preparedness and response. We had a, a large group of people who helped us construct a list of critical and life-saving drugs. We looked in particular for drugs that uh, if, if they weren't present, uh, had a very high likelihood of the person dying because of absence of that drug. Uh, drugs that if their absence would increase the mortality rate excessively or substantially, or if an alternative was not available. We also looked for drugs that would result in care that would not be humane to a person uh, without that drug. Imagine being intubated if you didn't have the sedatives and anesthetics that we use when we intubate patients to put them on a ventilator, for example. Um, that would be rather inhumane care if we didn't have drugs to moderate that uh, effect. And then we also took into account drugs with no reasonable alternative. Sometimes there simply is not an alternative drug to treat a particular condition. Uh, a drug that came to mind there was uh, vincristine. Vincristine is an old drug. It's generically available. Uh, it's not cost prohibitive. It's rather inexpensive, for a matter of fact. But uh, vincristine for a period of time was in short supply. And there were cancer patients, and especially pediatric cancer patients, whose disease was getting worse because vincristine simply was not available or it had to be rationed and limited uh, in use. Uh, next slide, please. So we developed first a critical drug list. Um, ben, can you go to the next one? Yeah, we developed the critical drug list. We defined the definition is here in blue, drugs that when medically needed in acute care must be available and used within hours or days of the need of the, or the patient will suffer serious outcomes which may include disability or death. And we noted that lack of availability of an effective substitute may also cause serious health outcomes or uh, limited ability to provide humane care. So we created our list of 156 drug molecules. It's been provided to uh, the, the committee. And that 156 drug molecules, we then screened against the FDA shortage list and the American Society of Health System Pharmacists shortage list. And we found that a fourth of those drugs were in short supply, according to the FDA list, and 41.7% were in short supply, according to the ASHP list. And I would point out that these shortages were largely present even before COVID-19. Uh, 
So this isn't a COVID-19 effect. We, we have shortages, a fourth of all of the drugs on our critical drug list are already in short supply. And if you look at the hospital uh, pharmacy list, which gets down to the physician and, and pharmacist treating the patients, uh, it's 41.7% short at that level. If you go to the next slide, as COVID-19 began to happen and, and unfold, and as people became aware that we were developing this drug supply map uh, out there, they began calling us about drugs that could be used for COVID-19. Early on, we looked at the antibiotics because uh, we thought that secondary infections from um, COVID-19 might require antibiotics and we found shortages there. Uh, so we composed and compiled a list of 40 critical drugs for treating COVID-19 patients. And again, that list has been provided to the committee. Um, for those 40 drugs, 45% are in short supply according to FDA's list, 75% in short supply according to ASHB's list. And in fact, most of these drugs were in short supply even before COVID-19 hit. Now, a few have come along. The ASHP list got actually as high as 80% of the drugs were in short supply uh, back in April and May uh, of this year. So these are alarming levels of shortage uh, and they have persisted. The shortage level hasn't gone down as COVID-19 has proceeded. Now, I, I will give kudos and compliments to the drug distribution system. Wholesalers, the, the GPOs, the health systems have shifted product around so that when a hotspot occurs in one area, they would shift drug from one region of the country to another, and they were able to moderate a lot of the surges in certain areas. But I would point out to you that today we have 30 and 40 states all in surge mode, and it's harder to find places to shift drug away from uh, and, and to shift it to certain areas. And the other thing I would point out is we're hearing uh, reports that uh, large hospital and health systems have done a fairly good job of managing their supply and even uh, laying in a, a stock of critical drugs to be prepared. And they have the warehouses we heard about but if there's a critical access hospital, a rural hospital, that's not affiliated with a large system, they don't have the resources to have a warehouse of drugs on supply and to have excessive stock. And they never even imagined themselves uh, nine months ago treating COVID-19 patients, but there are rural hospitals today treating COVID-19 patients and experiencing uh, uh, serious challenges with COVID-19 drugs. If you go to the next slide, so, so far we've talked about critical acute drugs and critical COVID-19, which is a subset of the acute drugs essentially. But we also believe strongly that there's a need to understand and track critical chronic drugs. We define those as drugs that when medically needed and chronic care must be available and used within a few days or weeks of the need and on a regular basis, or the patient will suffer serious outcomes, which may include debilitating disease progression, and worsening health status resulting in emergency care, hospitalization, or death. Absence of a critical chronic drug or lack of available substitutes may cause serious conditions. And uh, we're in the process of developing that list. We expect that list to be on the order of 500 drug molecules. Um, we don't know what percent are in short supply yet, uh, but, but we are and we will probably within six months have the critical chronic drug list out and start tracking the level of shortages that occur here. The poster child here uh, calls out something that again is not COVID-19 related, but a, a issue and product quality. Uh, NDMA, the nitrosamine uh, that you get by grilling hot dogs and a little black uh, uh, charcoal, uh, NDMA has a carcinogenic effect. And uh, two or three years back, NDMA was found in Valsartan. And then uh, Valsartan products began being recalled. And many, uh, as much as two thirds of all the Valsartan was recalled. Then a year or so ago, ranitidine products were found to have Valsartan and we've removed all of the ranitidine from the marketplace because of Valsartan. Now we're seeing metformin products with NDMA in it. And we've had uh, 
10, 15 different manufacturers' uh, metformin products removed from the market. If this continues and all of the metformins removed, I would challenge the clinicians, what drug would you use as your initial uh, line of therapy for a type 2 diabetic patient who failed on diet but, but needs an oral medication? Yes, we have other oral medications, but they're more expensive. They have other safety problems. Uh, there's not an easy substitute for metformin as a first line of uh, chronic therapy. So we think the chronic drugs will also, in this case, the chronic drugs, uh, the acute drugs are drugs used in response to an emergency or disaster. Chronic drugs, their absence may actually be the cause of the crisis or disaster because these patients will show up at the emergency room and it will overload uh, physician and emergency care for patients, uh, treating patients who can't get medicine. Last slide. So our, our team uh, with Dr. Osom and myself and, and others at Minnesota are trying to build this drug supply map and we're identifying critical drugs that we're focusing on first. Uh, and we want to make the drug supply map um, uh, robust enough that we can take a problem like the Valsartan or NDMA on metformin and identify all products in the market and go look at them quickly and know rather than waiting three or four years to sort through an NDMA problem, we want to be able to address those problems earlier. With that, I thank you and look forward to your questions. Thanks, Steve. That's uh, really uh, thought provoking. Um, I'm sure I and my committee members will have lots of questions, but I want to hear from the rest of our panelists first. Uh, and next up is Lisa Hedman from the World Health Organization. Lisa, are you there? Can you flip on your camera? So thanks again for inviting me. Um, I'll be joined also by my colleague, um, uh, Pernet, who will be talking a little bit about a different type of list. Um, just to give you a little bit of introduction, my name is Lisa Hedman. I'm, I'm with the World Health Organization. And I'm uh, part of a special initiatives group that sits in the office of one of our assistant directors general. And uh, we've been largely involved in um, what's been happening with COVID, but um, uh, our, our day jobs are a little bit different. And that, from my standpoint, involves managing um, our initiatives on shortages of medicines. And Pernet's focus is actually on substandard and falsified medicines, which some people would call counterfeit, but this, this is our official language. Um, and we bring those two together because uh, we recognize that once something is in shortage, the, the likelihood that it will find itself in um, the substandard and falsified circuits goes up. So I want to jump, I'm going to try to keep within time. If I can jump to the next slide. I want to just talk about um, two lists in particular. And the first one is the um, uh, interagency emergency health kit. And so I'm going to, we have much, we have more lists than this, but the two that seemed most relevant to me were these two. So one is a list that we refer to as the interagency emergency health kit. I'll let you absorb the, the information that's in the slide. And at the bottom, you've actually got two websites uh, where you'll actually find the entire, um, you'll, you're, you'll find the entire publication um, that, and all the contents of the publication. The, there's, there's two lists that are going on in this one. One is the model list of essential medicines. And for WHO, that is um, the basic list of medicines that should be at the base of every health center to make sure that people can get treated. It's not a comprehensive health system, it is the basic. In other words, if you don't have it, you probably don't have a functioning health system. Um, when we talk about emergencies though, that's not the entire list that we look at. The interagency emergency health kit is a physical kit as much as it's a list. So UN agencies have these things packed and ready to go sitting at um, ports of warehouses. It, we don't necessarily keep that many in inventory. When, a, when we use the word kit, it can give you the impression that it's something that you can put on a backpack. It's actually um, an ocean freight container full of uh, medicines. It's enough for 10,000 people for three months. And um, the way this kit it was developed was basically recognizing a need that a number of agencies respond to emergencies, <clears throat> some UN agencies, other partner agencies. Um, but when you all respond and you all do different things, it actually doesn't help the chaos on the ground. And so these kits were developed for um, natural disasters, conflict areas, not necessarily um, geared to respond to pandemics, but you could use them in certain cases. So the, the purpose of a kit is to make sure that down to the packing configuration and even some of it's color coded, that no matter who sends that kit, when the recipient opens it, it's going to be identical. They're going to know exactly what's in it, exactly where it's where they can find it, 
and if they have to distribute onward in a in, a, in the recipient country that they know exactly what they're distributing and where um, one of the other principles of this kit is that it's modular. Um, you can adapt it to different emergencies. You can sort of imagine that an emergency in the Ukraine, they might not really be interested or uh, have a need for malaria medicine. So you want to make sure that um, <clears throat> not everything on that, you know, we deal internationally, so we have to be aware of the fact that needs are different in different regions of the world. And, you know, that's, that's one example. One of the other things that happens in conflict zones is that you tend to have um, higher rates of violence against women. So we have rape kits and things in those uh, emergency kits that we might not have in a different type of situation. So um, the kit is updated, the contents are updated every two years. The update is based on changes that happen to that broader list of essential medicine, but also changes that happen uh, in treatment guidelines. Uh, you know, we've seen, we have HIV medicines in, them for, in, in the kits for chronic care patients and uh, HIV treatments have been changing over time. So when there's a change in a treatment guideline, change in an emergent in the essential medicines list, that provokes a change for us to make sure that what's in that emergency health kit is actually usable. Um, we do have contracts and may, most UN agencies have contracts. So while we might have one or two sitting at the port, there's also a contract that sits behind it that says that that kit has to be um, replenished within 72 hours in case there's a need to continue to deploy. So this is a, this is a significant effort that all UN agencies partner in. It, it goes beyond UN agencies. We are actually part of a group called the Interagency Pharmaceutical Coordination Group, and there are a number of agencies, Médecins Sans Frontières or uh, Doctors Without Borders, for example, is one of the groups that buys that particular kit. So I wanted to share that one because it's a very long-standing kit. This kit has existed since the 1980s, and it's been adapted over time to different types of emergencies. And this aspect that I mentioned that's modular, um, is, is an important one. So I want to jump to the next slide, but um, as I do that, I want to just bring up a point. So I think, you know, when we were talking among ourselves before this meeting, one of the things we talked about is the need to recognize that a list has to have a purpose. And any list, um, regardless of its purpose, the benefit of the list is the fact that it gets managed. And so something happens to that list. Uh, it gets managed. There's responses that happen. Um, so uh, each list has its own purpose and each list has its own dynamic. So I want to jump to um, something that happened uh, that everyone knows happened in, the, in this current pandemic, which is that we've had severe shortages. We have a portal that we've developed where we identify an ongoing dynamic list of shortages. It's not, it's not ready for public consumption. We decided not to try to open it up during the pandemic, but we actually um, have we collect external data and we have algorithms that identify medicines that are at risk based on what we see about those medicines. And that's something that we push out and we, we will start polling countries on those. That's something that I'm not bringing into this discussion, but just uh, just so people are aware, we, we this is the list that we developed uh, to watch during um, during the pandemic was actually based on what we, have, what we are developing as a larger initiative. So I just wanna talk a little bit about um, what happened in the pandemic and the type, the way the lists have been developed and watched. Um, this is a risk-based approach for us, and I think I've heard the other speakers talk about, you know, what is the risk, and the risk is that patients can't get treated, and I think we were all very sensitive to the issue that ICU medicines were going in and out of shortage on a regular basis. Uh, we were also aware that drugs that were, we call them repurposed drugs, or drugs that have an indication, but that also were being investigated for use in treating COVID-19 patients, such as hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine, those were also going into shortage because people were getting into speculative procurement. And by speculative, we mean they were hoarding it with the intent of getting into parallel sale uh, or price increases, things that happen when you see a shortage. Um, a couple of other things that, that we saw um, when we looked at <clears throat> everything that happened, we were also acutely aware of the fact that a large amount of raw materials come from China and India, which were very, very hard hit by the pandemic. And knowing how much that was gonna affect the medicine supply chain, we looked at that as a risk factor. So in looking at this particular list that we started monitoring and we started polling our regional offices, our industry counterparts, our industry associations, um, our other UN partners, um, what we were really looking for was anything that would confirm or deny these risks. And one of them we knew was going to be the risk of the API not being available whether it was because the factory closed down, whether it was because transportation uh, was limited or even export restrictions. So what we, what we first did is we identified um, both medicines, but also a particular type of risk. And we developed that to make sure that we were not just watching a certain list of medicines, but that we were watching medicines that would be at risk based on the risk factors that we found. So I wanna jump to the next slide and just show you what I mean by this. Um, we, we took a very simple approach 
You can see on this slide that we talked about level one, two, three, and four of risk. And this is just so that we can poll people and say, what's happening globally with these medicines? This is not a complete list, but you can see there's a pretty broad range of things on, on the list. Metformin, I think our previous speaker talked a lot about metformin. That's, that's uh, it's a significant challenge and it's risk just escalated. This, this hasn't been updated. Heparin is also a risk. Heparin though is not a risk for all countries. Not all countries use porcine-based heparin. Some use bovine-based heparin, which is not much of a, a shortage risk, but, the, um, but because we have uh, increased use of anticoagulants based on some of the newer treatment guidelines, we're seeing problems in low and middle income countries who are dependent on heparin. They don't have access to some of the new classes of anticoagulants. And so these heparin shortages that have been chronic since that date back to the ninth, probably 1989, if I'm not mistaken, um, that's gonna, that is hitting low and middle income countries particularly hard because they don't really have, uh, they don't have access and it's really a financing issue. It's a financial problem where they don't have access to some of the new generation anticoagulants. But you can see that what happens here is that we're looking at different risks and we're looking at different medicines. And so these two are a factor of each other as we move through this pandemic. Um, you can see that influenza vaccine is on that list. And one of the risk factors for influenza vaccine is, um, is diverted production capacity. Manufacturers made their batches of influenza vac vaccine and then they've turned over production to other things. So they aren't going to go back, which they might do in, another, in a different situation, in this situation, they are not going to go back and make additional batches of influenza vaccines. So we are experiencing vaccine shortages for influenza, primarily in Western Europe. We know that there's probably some shortages uh, with some, some manufacturers in the United States. Um, I wanna just point out one last thing before I turn over to Pernet. Um, when we look at a list like this, um, one of the things that we know in a pandemic is when you have a surge like that uh, in terms of demand and in terms of the other problems, the export restrictions, the API problems, the factory closures, the limits in transportation. We know that most medicines that um, go to countries fly in planes. They don't necessarily fly in cargo planes. Depending on where you are, 75% of that air cargo is actually coming in passenger planes. And so, you know, the, the lack of airspace uh, or cargo space in airplanes was was vastly reduced. So it doesn't really matter when, when you see these medicines, you have to line up every single risk that's affecting them. And um, the purpose of being able to do that is to be able to negotiate a solution. We know that in short-term solutions, regulatory flexibilities are often your best, um, uh, your, your best countermeasure. Uh, in some cases, it's a clinically al uh, appropriate alternative, but in a lot of cases, it's actually trying to identify an alternative source and using some regulatory flexibilities to bring that medicine temporarily onto a market. But the purpose of this list was to be able to negotiate. And it, that included negotiating with governments who were putting up export restrictions, negotiating with ICAO and IATA to make uh, to prioritize medicine deliveries, um, and also working with manufacturers to try to help them. Normally we don't, as a, as a UN agency, we don't get involved in trying to help uh, commercial entities. But in this case, we were trying to work with them to actually treat, to, to see what was a realistic demand. They were getting, um, you know, requests for orders for five times the amount of hydroxychloroquine and 10 times. And they didn't want to ramp up production without having some uh, ability to see whether that was realistic or not. So negotiating with everybody that could be negotiated with to try to find solutions to these things, even negotiating with governments to leave certain API plants open. And uh, in other cases, negotiating with governments to make sure that workers were protected so that they could go to work in terms of transportation crew and even some of the factory workers. So those were the types. So this list is very different from the other one. This list was developed with the intent to try to negotiate solutions and to try to target those risks and target those negotiations where they would be effective. The other one is a preparedness list. So you can see two very, very different purposes. So I want to stop there. And I want to, I think the, the rest of the slides um, are, are Pernet slides, and she can talk to you a little bit about what we do in, in situations where we have falsified medicines, because that obviously also leads to shortages. When you have a massive distribution of something that's falsified and you have to pull it off the market, um, that, that has a huge impact on availability, and particularly in a low income or middle income situation where you may not have the financing available to replace that inventory on a rapid basis. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, turn over to Pernet. Thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you all. I think, Lisa, we're thankful that there's no interpreters who've got to follow um, your, your steam. Um, I'll try and be brief. The essence is um, we can talk about shortages and beyond the direct impact uh, that was highlighted, I believe, by, by Duke as well as Andrew, that um, if people don't get the treatment that they need, they won't be cured and they might die. It also has 
creates a market space, a market opportunity for substandard and falsified medical products. In 2017, WHO agreed to definitions of substandard and falsified medical products, which um, precisely exclude any considerations of intellectual property rights. So a falsified product is not a generic product. Both generic and innovative products can become falsified. And we live, of course, in a globalized world with globalized supply chains. And if you look at substandard falsified medical products like an infectious disease, no supply chain is safe and no supply chain's integrity can be guaranteed until the supply chains of everyone have got appropriate oversight. There's three main forces um, that drive the existence of substandard and falsified medical products. They're most likely to reach patients in a situation where you've got a convergence of poor governance, constrained access, and weak technical capacity. When we talk about poor governance, we talk about poor procurement practices, unethical practices and corruption. And here I'm trying to make the distinction between need and greed, and also inefficient administrative structures. So all of these poor uh, governance uh, forces directly impact the supply chain integrity. In terms of constrained access, you've got affordability, which is um, the capacity to pay for a product without incurring um, catastrophic um, out-of-pocket payment. Acceptability, and acceptability is a very interesting one because that's the desire to buy or to demand a certain product. And in COVID-19, we have seen how um, particular media attention on certain therapeutics has uh, made the demand for these therapeutics explode, regardless of what the recommendations of health authorities have been. And of course, there's availability, which can be severely constrained by shortages. In weak technical capacity, you've got limited awareness. People sometimes are not aware of the issue of substandard and falsified medical products. You've got um, limited capacity and capability to have effective oversight. And of course, you've got overburdened um, agencies. Next slide, please. This um, simplified and selective timeline here shows the relation between um, certain media events, attention that has been brought to certain therapeutics or diagnostics of interest uh, for COVID-19, and the subsequent report to the WHO's global surveillance and monitoring system of a falsified or substandard version. So very early on in March, we started to have falsified in vitro diagnostics reported to us. Shortly after there was a lot of publicity um, by non-health experts on the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine, we started to get the first reports of falsified um, hydroxychloroquine. As soon as there was publicity on the efficacy of antiretrovirals, we started to get those reported as being falsified. And it kind of goes on and on and on, and I've only done some selections. Um, we had falsified vaccines reported very early on, um, and those were complete inventions. We've started to have phase uh, three trial vaccines um, copied and, and reported to us. And what's interesting is that we've had some falsified influenza vaccine that has been reported to us, and those have been reported in shortages. So the matrix that Lisa puts together is a way for us to kind of preempt and to detect early on the vulnerability of certain regions or certain products to becoming to having substandard and falsified versions circulating around. Um, so the influenza vaccine is, is not a COVID-19 treatment, of course, but the demand for this particular product has surged because WHO has and others have recommended that uh, influenza vaccination starts early this year to avoid co-infections. Um, next slide, please. This slide here is just the definitions of what substandard and falsified medical products are and why it's a problem. Um, I'll leave it to, to, to the uh, audience to be able to read, re read it. Just one thing, there was a couple of models that were done in 2017 to estimate the um, impact of substandard and falsified medical products. And we estimated for only two diseases in a very specific population. So um, children under five in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa who had malaria or who had um, lower respiratory tract infections, so pneumonia, 
and who had been taking substandard or falsified antibiotics or antimalarials. What were the incremental deaths due to these um, substandard or falsified medical products? And we found that the incremental deaths was 286,000 children per year. If you divide that by the number of days, by the number of hours, that's one child every two minutes. And these deaths aren't utterly avoidable because the treatments have been developed and they've been brought all the way down to the patients, you know, from tarmac to patient. And at the end of the day, they got something that just did not work. So you've spent money, you've wasted money, and you've given patients the wrong thing. And you've totally eroded trust in health systems. And we know with the COVID-19 pandemic, how easy it is to lose trust and how difficult it is to regain it. So you can imagine if we start to have loads of falsified or substandard COVID-19 therapeutics or COVID-19 vaccines, which reach patients, um, how difficult it will be to get compliance from, uh, from public. And that's it for me. All right. Well, thank you. Thank uh, all of you. That Those were excellent presentations. Um, scary presentations, but excellent presentations. Um, so um, we are going to uh, shift into Q&A mode here. So I invite my um, committee members to both uh, show themselves uh, and to, um, to raise their hands if they have questions. Um, at, uh, while we do that, maybe I can ask a question here. So the, the message, I got two messages from your, your presentations. First was that most of the lists we have are predominantly about um, the essential nature of the drugs to patients rather than the riskiness of the drugs to disruption or uh, shortness of supply. I mean, the first few lists, the FDA list was all about uh, the essential nature of the drugs, not necessarily the risk. And Steve's, yours was also, except then you went back and said, okay, here are the things that are essential. How many of them have been disrupted? And it was a whole bunch of them. And then in the WHO study, same thing, you know, you, the first list was medical essential, and then you, you looked and said, okay, here are these risk factors. Uh, and so you started to introduce the criticality or, or the, uh, the, the riskiness there, and again, found that things are, are at risk. So I guess my question to you with that as an observation is, um, is, is preparedness for pandemics or other major disruptive events um, a, a unique thing, or is it really just an extension of what we're experiencing under normal circumstances? We have so many things that are in short supply now that when an emergency strikes, well, you know, we're gonna have even more shortages. And so it, it, is there something different about preparing supply chains in terms of resilience for an exceptional event? Or is this really that we need better blocking and tackling for the shortages we're experiencing now to be ready for an emergency? So I'd be interested in any or all of your takes on what do you think about preparedness from normal times to exceptional times like COVID? How do you want us to respond? Do you want to just go in order or? Um, uh, if like, I, I, you know, uh, sure. Uh, since you're on camera, why don't you just start us, Lisa? Okay. Um, I want to go back to the 2009, 2010 pandemic um, for, for H1N1. And I think we learned a lot of lessons in that pandemic about preparedness. And so, you know, when you look at the different lists that people have talked about, they're, they're all about preparedness. They're all about trying to be as prepared as you can. And if you take preparedness a step further, you know, in a lot of cases we're stockpiling or we're creating inventories. But what we're doing when we do this, whether it's a stockpile, whether we've got a kit ready to go, whether we have a list that, that we know that we can move into rapid action, what we're talking about in that case is we're talking about pre-positioning the product. And we're saying these products are important. We're going to pre-position these products as part of our preparedness. I think the lesson learned here and it goes back to the to the H1N1 pandemic, and it's it's become a critical issue as these vaccines for for COVID-19 start rolling out. Is that there's also some processes that are risky processes where you kind of have to think about how can you pre-position your preparedness to act on certain processes. 
So I'll bring up two or three. One of them is regulatory flexibilities. If you run out and you have to get a different supply source and you have to bring something temporarily onto a market where it hasn't been before, you need to have some kind of regulatory flexibility, but that reliance has to be there before the pandemic. So if I'm gonna call another regulator and ask them to share a dossier with me so that I can look at some of the safety information, decide if it's suitable and safe for my population, that reliance has to exist before the pandemic. It's very difficult to create it during an emergency. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that it, um, if you really line up all of the different things that happen in an emergency, we've developed simulation games around this, they exist, but you know, stepping outside of just regulatory affairs, there are a lot of different processes that you use to solve problems and emergencies. And what we found in the H1N1 pandemic and what we're finding in this one is that people are not necessarily prepared to move into those um, actions that they need to take. And so really looking at some of the critical risk factors, some of them are very new. Nobody ever imagined something like an export restriction on an API so that it basically stopped production. Um, and nobody ever imagined this level of transportation disruption. So um, you can't predict every type of process or every type of problem, but the degree to which you can predict um, that you're going to have to rely on certain processes, you want to make sure that those are up and ready to go, that they exist, that you've created those partnerships, um, and that they function. I mean, people like to talk about rosters of emergency staff, and those are just lists of people that may or may not be available when you need them. And so practicing those things, really making sure that those partnerships work, if, if they're partnerships, or whatever that process is, that you practice that process. So it's about pre-positioning products, but where you can't anticipate, you're gonna to have to pre-position process to the degree that you possibly can. <clears throat> and so I think those are, that's probably the, the, the biggest lesson learned that we can bring forward from these two pandemics. Over. Yeah, nice distinction. Anybody else? Steve? Linda? Steve, you're talking, but you're muted. Got it. Um, that was very helpful, Lisa, to distinguish well, product and process well, just, differences. Just, just. Uh, I would say that uh, often preparedness is planning for what we know that we need. And we can identify a list of critical drugs that we know that we need. And that's helpful, all of the critical lists that that the various parties discussed today. But one thing I think we learned in the pandemic, the pandemic not only created a surge in demand for things we could have predicted that we would need in a pandemic, but the pandemic itself caused factory shutdowns, transportation disruptions, and as, as Lisa mentioned, the uh, export bans and other things that randomly hit products that we could not have predicted. We don't know if, if there's a factory making drugs in Wuhan, China. It isn't necessarily making just drugs for COVID-19. It's making drugs for any purpose uh, th that's needed in the medical uh, field. So uh, sometimes the, the supply disruption side can lead to random drugs being unavailable that we could not have predicted. Now, obviously, the, one, the drugs that are on our critical list would also be most critical, even if they're randomly knocked out because of supply disruption. But, but some things you can't necessarily plan for on a drug by drug basis, but you need to know where your vulnerabilities are and which drugs only have one source of production in the globe. Uh, so that if something happens in that region, it could knock out the world's supply of that drug. And hi. This is uh, Linda. Thanks, Steve, for those um, comments. Um, I also want to uh, just uh, talk a little bit about uh, device shortages. Device shortages, I'm from the Center for Devices, um, and device shortages are a little bit different from um, drug shortages, obviously. Uh, the products are very different. The supply chains are very different. The um, life cycles are very different. So um, during this pandemic, uh, some of the things that um, we have definitely learned uh, with regards to trying to avoid having um, uh, device shortages uh, are, uh, you know, you talk about the regulatory flexibility um, because uh, in devices, uh, you know, we do have uh, 
um, different triggers that we can activate and, and have done so in this pandemic and really understanding the implications um, of those regulatory triggers and making sure that uh, we have uh, adequate sources of data to understand uh, how uh, the, or rather the unex uh, unexpected consequences of any of those actions. So when we're talking about counterfeit product, for example, um, if we exercise some degree of regulatory flexibility, what does that mean for how we need to monitor for counterfeit product? Um, so really trying to um, balance uh, those types of uh, streams of information in order to make sure that um, we are getting the right product to the right people at the right time. Thank you. Um, good points. Doug, were you, you uh, trying to insert something there? Well, I think you're, the concept you're looking for is, is resilience. Anticipating emergencies and planning for them, as Stephen said, is, is really challenging. Hurricanes in Puerto Rico are very different from plant fires in Kansas and pandemics. And, and so you're, you're, you're probably going to be challenged to create thing, a, a system to anticipate those. Instead, what you need to do is capacity building and resilience. And that's you know, that means that each of the manufacturers take a close look at their ability to respond with agility to changes in demand. Um, and and wherever, where necessary, necessary because the products are high value for public health or because they're high value in a, in a response to a medical countermeasure setting, um, they create redundancies. They create backup systems. They create second factories. They, they create ways to be able to respond in an emergency. Um, that's a little bit of the source of the two kinds of products we identified on the FDA list. There is a list driven by the, 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 the public health need to have them available. There is a second list, the medical countermeasure list, that sought to identify products that are necessary from a national security perspective, independent of their importance for public health. Many of them are critical for public health. But above and beyond, there is they, they, they stand out as products where their availability is more than particularly important from a national security perspective. So resilience is the is the key. It's the thing we're trying to find ways to encourage. Yeah, I really like the point that you've driven home, all of you, that where you know something's coming, you can take a product kind of solution, pre-positioning as Lisa called it, but that where you don't, the only way to do it is through response or process, as she put it. So that diversified uh, resiliency uh, strategy is necessary. Pernette, did you have something to add? Yes, I just wanted to add, regarding the process um, focused approach rather than the product focused approach, um, in any pandemic or in any crisis, it's important to know your unknowns, of course. Um, and if we focus on the driving forces without knowing exactly what products might be more or less um, affected, you can have a pretty good idea of where you might have shortages, because of course um, shortages might affect some geographical regions more than others, some populations more than others, and there's going to be, you know, the driving forces that we have identified for substandard and falsified, it's not just the availability, which is on shortage, um, technical capacity, and I'm thinking, you know, to what Linda is saying about the regulatory capacity to approve medical devices or in vitro diagnostics, that will influence whether or not a product is available, it's accepted, it exists, and whether or not it can kind of circulate freely through the supply chain. So, so by, by kind of focusing on the driving forces, you have this process which helps you really map um, the unknowns and to, to really prevent some of those from happening because you know that there's going to be some things for, for example, with COVID-19, we know that there's a big threat on COVID-19 vaccines. Which vaccine in particular? I don't know. But I know that, that those types of threats are going to be different, that maybe ultra-cooled chain ones are going to be more vulnerable to being substandard. But on the other hand, they might be more um, uh, kind of guarded, literally guarded uh, the, during transportation. Uh, and it might be more difficult to switch. Uh, so, so you've got, you know, and, and, and people are focusing very much on the vaccines. You know, it's, it's, 
And they don't focus on the other things, like, for example, the specific syringes that have to go with the ultra cold chain ones. Um, and I, there, there's an image that's been circulating for a while, and it's, um, it shows a plane that was used in the Second World War. And um, it's full of bullet holes and it's got all the red dots are all the bullet holes. And uh, it's the plane that got back and people said, OK, well, we've got to focus on strengthening where those red dots are, because that's the bullet holes. And we always focus on that. But actually, those planes managed to get back. Uh, so I can see that Wally's nodding. So maybe you can expand a bit on that. Um, but yeah, processes really help us map the unknowns a little bit better. Uh, and we've always got to think, I mean, the way I think for substandard and falsified, it's market opportunities. Um, if we don't move fast enough, either in terms of information or product, others will. And that gap can be filled in really, really fast. Over. Well said. Yes, I, I know that example. I'm an operations research guy, and that's one of those stories that all OR people tell. Anyway, um, but but apt here. Um, so I'm going to uh, bring in some of my committee members who have uh, questions. Alistair, you have something for the panelists? Yes, I, I want to respond to um, something that the last three panelists actually raised, and that's regulatory reliance. Um, there was actually a National Academy committee that reported last year, and I chaired that. And we weren't smart enough to anticipate COVID, but we did uh, anticipate emergencies and recognize that exactly as Burnett just said, if you're going to approve vaccines, it's unlikely that most, for example, most um, third world countries will have the expertise to approve an mRNA vaccine or review an mRNA vaccine. They're going to have to rely on um, first world um, regulators. So as Lisa said, the ability to respond uh, to shortages is very dependent on us facilitating regulatory reliance. And I would recommend that report to you because although we didn't anticipate COVID-19, we certainly recognized the problems of regulatory reliance and recognized that it was a bi-directional problem. So that while the EMA and the FDA might want to rely on one another in, in certain areas, like inspections, for um, less resourced regulators, they would have to totally rely on first world regulators for more complex therapeutics and diagnostics. Okay, Lewis? Would you like us to reflect on any of those comments? If you have, I was just pausing there. If you had reflections, we'd love to hear them. I mean, we're here to listen to you, so. It's a, the, the, the uh, anticipating the need for regulatory reliance is, is actually, the, this does, it dates all the way back to the, uh, to the pandemic of 2009 and, and discussions that have gone on from then. And I think one of the, one of the things that the international community of regulators has done well has been to recognize that, that particular issue. And, and, and especially as you point out the bi-directionality of it. Um, you know, if you, if you look all the way upstream into the research and development and the production of the vaccines, vaccine manufacturers are not eager to put vaccines on markets where they don't have confidence in the market authorization process uh, and the ability to manage um, their own liability uh, for as, as, these, as these vaccines in this case and you know, perhaps therapeutics at some point as they move forward. So the, there is, it, it wasn't a program developed in response to H1N1, but there, there is, um, there is a, a reliance mechanism that's hosted by WHO. WHO has a, um, we, we don't have the authority to give market authorization, but we do have a regulatory function um, that collaborates with EMA, FDA, and the other stringent regulatory authorities as the vaccines move toward market authorization. But one of the other things that ha is hosted at WHO is that uh, anything that goes through, it's called the prequalific, the, the, the regulatory authorization equivalent that WHO gives is called prequalification. Um, and we have, there's websites that I'll let people read in terms of knowing exactly what it is, but it's a regulatory function that stops at the ability to give a market authorization. We don't have that type of jurisdiction. But what it does do is it, um, it provides a reliance mechanism for regulators that don't have a lot of capacity. And so they, they, have, there's, they have specific agreements with WHO where they participate in trainings, they participate in collaborative registration processes, and they also can have access to redacted portions of, the, of dossiers with the intent, if the intent is to give a market authorization. 
So the this process it has two purposes. For manufacturers, it stops this. One of the things that happens with a new product is that every country has their own uh, version of a regulatory review. What the data they might want might be different from what was provided in the originator's uh, dossier. You can imagine the, the number of iterations of regulatory registrations that would have to happen. Um, and that's going to slow down your, your, your path to market, particularly in the low and middle income country environments. And so that reliance that those regulators can enter into with WHO, it has two purposes. One is to fast track, one is to support the regulator in terms of they, they don't just get a dossier to review themselves, they get a copy of whatever WHO has. And that might be the review of a stringent regulator, it might be WHO's review, whatever it is, they will, they will have that in order to review it. And so, but the, the purpose is to fast track. That's the second purpose. It's, it's, to put some, it's to put some juice behind that regulator in terms of the knowledge and the information they get, but it's also to fast track that market authorization and, and stop that iterative process where each country is going to have a unique process. It's not used for every single, pro, for every single product. It's, there's a limited number of products where this, this reliance mechanism uh, works. But this is one of the things that um, we're counting on in this pandemic to, to move the, the, the market authorization for the vaccines forward. We don't know how, what, we're not ready yet, we're, we're close, but uh, I, so I think that the, the, you know, the, the actual success is yet to be seen, but that, um, that reliance has been building for, for a number of years. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that, that people recognize and appreciate the importance of that. Over. So no further comments on that. Uh, Marta, did you have a question? Yes, so I have a question for Pranet and maybe Doug and Linda might also be able to speak to this. So uh, Pranet, thank you for, for raising the, the fraud issue, um, the falsification issue of product. So the, the charge for this committee specifically focused on the US market. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to what extent the issues you describe um, because a number of the examples you gave to us are actually from low-income countries. To what extent this is an issue that very much affects the U.S. market and the drugs that are sold in the U.S.? Thank you, Martha, for this question. Um, there's two things. The first is the global surveillance mon and monitoring system that's maintained by the WHO is a case reporting database. So you can't extrapolate um, reports to any kind of prevalence. There's a very strong bias that depends on the willingness and the capacity um, of regulatory authorities to report their incidents to us. And there's gonna be two big barriers to reporting. The first is people might be afraid that reporting to our system will reflect negatively on their um, regulatory authority. So sometimes you might have that barrier mainly for low and middle income countries where they're trying to achieve a higher recognition of the capacity of their regulatory authority. But for regulatory authorities, which tend to be a bit more mature, uh, we have observed, and that's interesting, that the barrier to reporting is, is not so much a barrier, but a, a, an absence of an incentive. They feel that reporting to the WHO system is not going to give them any return on investment in the short term. So if you have to ask a regulatory staff to sit down and to take 10 minutes or half an hour or whatever time it takes for them to report something, they've got to have some sort of return on investment. So it's true, we do get uh, far fewer reports from high income countries, but I suspect that it's not just to do with the lower prevalence of those high income countries. So that's more of a general remark and setting. Now, with that said, we know that there are um, many substandard and falsified uh, incidents that are detected in the US. And indeed, you have a very efficient uh, regulatory authority that allows you to deal with things um, independently. Um, what COVID has done, I find, is that it tends, it will shift the uh, risk of substandard and falsified medical products, it will shift it geographically to those countries who, for whom it's not necessarily traditionally considered to be a threat. This kind of limited awareness, it's going to translate for the US, for the EU, as a this isn't our problem kind of approach. You talk to um, low-income countries or middle-income countries about substandard and falsified medical products, they're immediately going to know what you're on about. You talk to, uh, to high-income regulators about this issue, very, very low priority 
in their uh, portfolio. And in this case, with COVID-19, because the COVID-19 uh, therapeutics and vaccines are probably going to be occurring first in the high-income countries, it's going to shift the risk precisely to, to these high-income uh, countries. And the risk that you have there is even though you've got highly efficient regulators, and I'm not speaking of the US here in particular, you might have regulators who are not aware of the risk or who are not prepared. So things might fall through the cracks. And it's not because something is not reported that it doesn't exist. Um, it just means that they haven't detected it or they haven't wished to report it. I hope, does that answer your question? I can see you smiling on the side. Yeah, I'm smiling because I've got to ask Doug to now comment. <laughs> But thank you, that was very helpful. Well, I, it's true that, that people in the US make conscious choices to market products that are not standard. I mean, one of the you know, one of the challenges we've seen in the controlled substances space, for instance, is, is people advertising opioids online. Definitely a bad idea without a prescription, without physician oversight, and we, and we know that the majority of those products are, are, are badly manufactured at a minimum. Many of them, perhaps most of them, don't contain any opioids at, at, at all. So um, I, I take Pranath's point. I, I think the point that the quality system gives the U.S., though, is there is an expectation that a marketed drug from a Mark from a pharmacy of record with a prescription on record is going to be made to a high degree of quality. I, I think that's a, a sort of promise that we do assume, that the U.S. market does assume, um, and, and one that, at least from the FDA's perspective, one we, we work very hard to maintain. I think that's fundamentally a different case than the individual that's looking to market a dietary supplement that contains an adulterated product or something like that. And, you know, they, 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 do, re, they do require slightly different tools, I think, don't they, Marta? Um, and I would just like to add in, chime in for um, the device perspective. Certainly in COVID, we have seen um, a, a market increase uh, in the U.S. for uh, devices such as respirators, masks, gloves, all kinds of PPE that is counterfeit um, and is substandard. So we um, typically have not seen that um, in, in um, non-COVID times, um, but just the, the demand. And, and as the, the point that was brought up earlier about that demand oftentimes will drive counterfeit product um, development. Um, and, and this is where um, our regulatory flexibility, specifically um, on some of the device side issues where there uh, may be more um, regulatory discretion can lead to um, uh, additional fraudulent product that, that we need to watch out for. But again, that's uh, for, I'm only speaking of devices. May I just very briefly um, respond? Um, so Doug, there's just a couple of things that I'd say to that and, and also for Linda. Um, first of all, uh, with, with regards to the markets, uh, of course, the, the capacity to oversee uh, the market by strong regulators is essential. But don't forget that you've got the internet as well. And, you know, in today's world, it doesn't matter from which website you're ordering stuff, it probably can reach uh, patients which are in your kind of jurisdiction market, uh, even though they've kind of supplied it themselves directly outside that market. And, and we can see what's interesting. It's not, you know, when we're saying B to, to, to C or, or it's, it's the, the consumer sometimes orders quite large volumes. Um, and I think Linda would strongly agree that one of the biggest vulnerabilities is this lack of regulatory um, oversight uh, for, for medical devices or, or the, I'm not saying again, just for the US, the US is pretty well off compared to a bunch of other countries. Um, but the, the less stringent regulatory environment for medical devices worldwide does create a greater opportunity for these products to be substandard and falsified. And with regards to medical devices, 
Um, of course, consumers in the US buying something that's in the pharmacy in the US, something that's in the regulated supply chain, the likelihood of that being substandard or falsified is quite low, of course. And you would expect that the quality control that has been done uh, pre-market is maintained, but you cannot apply the same type of quality assurance methods on medicines to medical devices or in vitro diagnostics. It's simply not possible, but in particular, the, the diagnostics, you can't do a quality assurance and send a diagnostic to a lab and say, is that one good or not? And, and that does create some additional complications. So for the substandards and the falsified in the regulated supply chain, likelihood is quite low, but again, you know, um, paradoxically, the US is sometimes more vulnerable than some other countries. I'm thinking of the Avastin case a couple of years ago, um, because of the way um, healthcare providers will order directly on the internet, you've got stuff that reaches patients directly. And that has got to do with um, how well countries rank on the universal healthcare coverage service index. We've seen a direct correlation uh, between universal healthcare uh, service index, a high service index, and um, a good resilience to substandard and falsified uh, medical products. So it's kind of that this reliance is a lot for pre-market and it's very, very important. And I'm really glad that Lisa has highlighted the great work that's done by our colleagues on this. But with supply chains, a lot of it is post-market. So you have to have that connection and, and it's difficult. And you, we have to think of ways to be reliant also post-market on our, on our supply chains and sharing data on the supply chain's integrity there, over. And there's work on traceability that's being done, so. Thank you. Lewis, did you have a question? Yes, I have um, a question that's going back to the sort of the basics of list making. And one of them is for Dr. Throckmorton and the others for uh, Dr. Schondelmeyer. Uh, to Dr. Th um, Throckmorton, my question is, um, you know, you had a particular mission given to you uh, by the executive order um, and you created the list. And, um, you know, we also have our own uh, marching orders. Uh, they're statutory. They're not an executive order. But I'm just curious what it was about the language and nature of the executive order that led you not to include uh, chronic uh, treatments uh, on your list and to focus only on acute care. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to get into the specifics of the decision making. I, I think the, the, the executive order focused on responsiveness and in, in, to, the, to the acute need. And, and we believed that it wasn't me, it was a broad group of individuals that, that an initial step focused on acute care medicines, on medicines that were needed in the short term setting was important given where we were, given where we were both in terms of the obvious response to the pandemic, also given where we were in response to the executive order and the language that we were, we were asked to use. We acknowledge that there is interest in chronic care medicines. Um, we think the determining which products in, might need to be on a list that are chronic care would be a separate set of criteria. That is the criteria that we applied for the medical countermeasures and the essential medicines in the current list might not suffice for the criteria that would be used to identify the chronic care met list. Um, and so as a start, we thought it was important to focus first and foremost on short-term medicines. In talking with the other stakeholders that we were, we were able to engage from the government, that seemed to be something that they endorsed. Um, we're interested in the comments. We're interested in what people think about that plan, that idea of beginning with a short-term acute care medicine focus and the implications for it, both with regards to the U.S. market, with regards to the potential impact on, um, on product availability and price, and ultimately on the impact on public health. With that in mind, then we think we'll be able to, there'll be a fuller discussion and it may well be that it, uh, other decisions might be made. But to begin with, we wanted to focus well, where we where we ended up focusing on the short term acute care setting. And um, thank you very much for that, and Dr. Schandelmeyer, um, You you created a list that specifically explicitly did include uh, uh, non acute treatments. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, whether uh, psychiatric drugs um, 
presented any kind of special uh, problems or considerations for you. Um, I, I want to make sure that that those particular uh, products are not like left out of consideration. Well, we're working on the chronic drug list. We haven't completed it yet. Uh, certainly, psychiatric drugs will be included in it. They do create the special problem, much like we have several protected classes of drugs where if one doesn't work, you switch to another and another and another because people are different, drugs are different. And so in that context, uh, it makes it harder to decide which ones do you put on the list, which ones do you consider alternatives, uh, and how do you come up with a definitive list at the end of that without listing all of the psychiatric drugs. And, you know, there are other categories of drugs, drugs for multiple sclerosis, drugs for certain types of cancer. Uh, there are other categories that are going to be much more problematic uh, than certain therapeutic categories. But we're we're working through those issues. You know, um, hearing all of my colleagues and the presenters, um, it's clear, I think the issue isn't that anyone can develop a definitive list. I think uh, this issue requires multiple lists. Uh, the lists depend on the purpose, as we've heard. They depend on the population being targeted. For example, we can, may come up with a very different list to have a stockpile for the active military in the U.S. That would be different than the list that FEMA or, or BARDA might develop to be prepared for disasters and natural events. And that would be different than a list to develop um, a reserve or a stockpile for the general American public if factories around the world are shut down because of disruption like COVID-19. So each of those would be different lists. Uh, they should consider each other and look for overlap and complementarity, uh, but, but they would be different lists. A, a second, another thing that we need to contemplate um, in this supply chain process is, first of all, what is the supply inventories that are out there of a drug in the supply chain? And then if a drug becomes unavailable, uh, we have a couple of issues. How long is the disruption going to be in place? So, for example, if they shut down factories in India for a month or two, our supply chain inventories can usually uh, ride through that challenge. But if they shut down factories in India for six months, we would have a number of drug products in the U.S. that would be in serious uh, uh, short supply. And then, in addition to time of disruption, there's the issue of time to start or increase production. And this speaks to, I think, the, the list that FDA has created and the API focus of that list is useful. It, we need the list, but realize patients can't take API. And if a drug shows up in short supply, even if we have a stockpile of the API, we have the time to get from API to a finished dosage form that you can give a patient. And we have to build that into our planning process and our process of shortages and how quickly can we fill in a gap of a shortage with an API versus a finished dosage form. So we have to, uh, we need the API list that FDA has developed, but we need to plan the next step too. For each of those products, how long will it take to convert it to a finished dosage form? Do we have the capacity? Do we have the availability of production facilities to do that in a timely manner. Well, this, this, we're past our uh, scheduled adjournment time, uh, for which I apologize, but you had so many great things to tell us that uh, I just didn't feel like I, I could stop us early. Um, does anybody have any remaining questions before we let our speakers um, go? Okay, if not, thank you so much. That your, your comments were exceptionally insightful and really helpful to our purpose. We really appreciate it. Um, we will be making any materials that you share with us publicly available through the uh, project public access file. That's required under section 15 of the Federal Advisory, Advisory Committee Act rules. So just so that you know that that's what happens to any materials we get uh, in the course of our um, deliberations.
So thanks again, everybody. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll do our best to make good use of all the information you fed us.